Okay, we're here today with uh, Sam Markison, and um, the interviewer, as usual, will be William McRae. Uh, we are July 23rd, 2015. July 24. 24? Or 23rd? 23rd. Oh, 23rd. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thursday, July 23rd, 2015, at the University of Toronto. So here we go. Uh, could you please state your full name? Samuel Walton Marcusen. And your age? I uh, will be 65 in four days. Oh, happy birthday. Uh, and where were you born? Richmond, Virginia in the USA. And as a child, what did uh, your parents do for a living? Uh, my mother taught school, English in high school, and my father sold real estate and also ended up working in the but in Virginia, you call it a savings and loan. I think there's a slightly different name for it in Canada. People who gave loans for people who want to build houses. Uh, okay. And um, and you, at a very young age, what was your pastime or what were your go-to activities? Oh uh, well, I shouldn't say it, but I actually watched some television, like most kids my age, more than my parents might have liked. Uh, <laughs> I, I got interested in, in photography and when I was a, a teenager, and that was a, one of my interests. Uh, I always kind of had an interest in gadgets or whatever was going on. But I was Yeah, just of a general sense, yes. But I was never, I wasn't one of these electronics or ham radio freaks that we had lots of it in my generation that was, didn't, didn't, didn't quite have the understanding of the electronics or the interest in that. And were there, was there any interest in uh, sciences in general? At oh, time? yes, I like science. My, my grandfather told my mother that I was going to be an inventor. So that was, he said, well, I had an interest in that type of things. But I also had interest in other topics. Interestingly, while I ended up in engineering, when I was taking all the standardized tests in high school and elementary school, I always did better on the verbal parts of the tests than I did on the math, math parts of the tests. So engineering and, and verbal sciences can go together quite well as long as you have a reasonable amount of aptitude in the, in the, in the, in the hardcore stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as a child, was there any idea on your part or even pressure on your parents' part of what you should do when you're all grown up? No, the pressure was you will go to college in the U.S. or university in Canada. That was the, okay. it, it was the expectation, but what you chose to study was never a particular hard topic. And uh, as a child or as a teenager at that point, was, did you have a specific idea of what you were going to when study? When I went to university, I thought I might study chemistry. I wasn't certain. I ended up studying chemistry Okay. as an undergraduate. And where was that? At the College of William and Murray in Virginia. And um, after, after your bachelor's, what did you do? When, when I was in my third year, junior year at university, I took a course I, due to a scheduling. I was forced to take a course in geology. I took the course in geology. I found I liked it. Then I took some more courses. And then as a, when I was in my last year, I decided that I'd like to study process metallurgy, the extraction of metals. So I, I applied to Columbia University from William and Mary. And I started there in graduate studies in 1972. And um, why, um, we know why metallurgy, but why chemistry, first of all? Oh, well, chemistry, well, chemistry came from a high school teacher who was quite okay. dynamic in grade 11. And metallurgy came out because of chemistry, because of geology. And also, when I was a student, but the first Earth Day, I think, was 1970 or 1971. And the environment was on everyone's mind. And even though I wasn't one of these people who necessarily participated in all the events, uh, interest in the environment and doing something about it had great appeal to me. And I think it had a great appeal to many of my colleagues as well. 
and I think as we all know, the, the mining metallurgy world has a, had and still has a lot to do around the environment. So it was a melding of chemistry, uh, environment, uh, geology, and the like. Okay. And just pick chemistry instead. Well, well, where yeah. I went to school, there was no engineering program. It was all okay. it was a, it was a liberal arts school. So yes. Okay. But okay. chemistry is a great introduction to uh, absolutely to process metallurgy and to related topics. I'm just curious: did um, environmental studies or sciences uh, inv exist at that time? Not really. No. Okay. No, no. The, you pretty well the you know the sciences where I went to school and in most schools would be physics, chemistry, biology, and maybe geology. Not all schools had that but environmental science wasn't wasn't really separated out as a discipline and uh, and computer science was just starting was in a nascent state okay and um, you are born in Virginia and you did go to school uh, uh, to American schools so why Canada now Oh, in 1980, I, I took a job after, univer after graduate school at a company called Inglehard, which is now part of BASF. I didn't really, that job wasn't to my taste. And after three years, I decided to look for a job. I went and talked to my thesis advisor, who steered me in the direction of working for INCO here. So I applied and uh, I got the position and that brought me to Canada. And what was the position? I started out as a research engineer at the what was then called the J. Roy Gordon Research Laboratory in Mississauga, now known as the Valley Technical Excellence Center, I believe. Okay, and what was what were your first kind of tasks or what do you remember from the beginning of your your career there? Uh, what I remember about INCO at the time in the research group was it was it was actually pretty freewheeling in some of the things we could do and some of the things that we could try. Everything had an application, but it was generally you generally had a fair bit of freedom to work on what you were as long as you were in the in the um, meeting the objective that you're working on in the vein that we're working on. At, at, in the Inglehard Research Laboratory, uh, they had a quite a rigid system of determining, of trying to ascertain what a project was worth, what the monetary value of this project would be if it was successful, and then how much money you could spend on your research to make this project work. And it was extremely structured and not really very creative, and I didn't think very productive actually. So, and I think unfortunately, the trend of trying to push more direct value from research, more direct, quicker value, is actually accelerated from those times as opposed to you. You have to work on an objective. You have to work with a goal. You have to work with an area. But it's not necessarily possible to define everything you're going to do right from the beginning. Especially if you don't know it, uh, it exists yet. Well, then, then, then you're, being, you're not actually doing research. So, mm -hmm. so, so the, the more interesting approach uh, appealed to me. Also, I had studied power metallurgy, high temperature metallurgy as a graduate student. And in, when I joined INCO in 1980, well, probably certainly in the non-ferrous world, the best high-temperature metallurgy industrial laboratory was was in Canada. It would be probably between Noranda and Inco, so it was a great place to go. And uh, may I ask why the your first job you you didn't like the job in the USA? Uh, I found it a little too constricting. I also wasn't doing power metallurgy. I was doing something else. I was studying. Uh, the uh, processing of white clay, which is a very, which is an interesting topic, but it didn't necessarily appeal to me. So you probably don't know where where you find white clay. It's probably in that piece of paper, or certainly in the, in the, possibly in that piece of paper. 
uh, white clay is used as a pigment for papers or as a pigment in paints to give it the, the color. And so there's a lot of surface chemistry involved in it and the so like. Oh, okay. And um, you had mentioned you went into chemistry because, probably because of a high school teacher. Yeah. Uh, do you have um, mentors throughout your life? Oh, I, I saw the question, yeah. <laughs> I thought about that. Yes, I had a, as an undergraduate, I had a professor who, who, who I quite liked, and he was a chemistry professor, head of department. His name was Ta Tari, and he was a very conservative individual, but he was, he, he took a lot of interest in students and interest in what they're doing, and he and I got along well. I kept, I kept in close contact with him until he passed away in 1987. Uh, my graduate school advisor was a fellow named um, Herbert Kellogg, who was a professor at Columbia, and he is still alive, and he was a well-known professor. And I was very fortunate with him. When I started working with him, he was in his early 50s. He had, he did mostly work on his own. He had very few students. But he, had, and he had created a, a reputation for himself. So I got to spend a lot of time talking with him. So when I was doing my research, he and I would typically talk about meet twice a week and spend about 45 minutes each time talking. And that's actually a lot of time, a lot of professors' time with a single graduate student, uh, possible because of the peculiar situation that I was in. The, um, the department, the mineral engineering department at Columbia was in the Henry Crumb School of Mines, which had some years as many faculty as it had students at that particular juncture in time. It had been been given a lot of money by Henry Crumb, and uh, so it was a good student-to-faculty ratio and a lot of, of, of interpersonal uh, relationships, which really created a really good educational process for me. So I, um, that was a great experience. Um, with the question about mentors, there's one, one name comes up in my mind, and it's a fellow I didn't have much, I did not have much uh, relationship with. He was the head of marketing at Inglehard when I first started working there. And I got a little project in which I was supposed to work closely with the operators. And I was quite possibly a cocky young fellow right out of getting a PhD and not paying particular attention to my customers in the operations. And in one of the research review meetings, things hadn't gone quite well. And it didn't appear that we were working very well together. And he absolutely humiliated me in front of a group of people, tore a strip off my back. And it was not a pleasant experience. But it was an object lesson in, you know, what, um, what, what, the what importance. exactly was the cause, the cause of him well, yelling he, at you? Well, he, he felt that we were, I wasn't working very well together with the operators and things weren't going well and like that. So he, so he, and, and it wasn't right. It probably was all correct. <laughs> but it, 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 hey, you know what? You get these things and you learn from them. And, and the lesson was, you know, you have to, you have to learn to get along with these people who do that and work together and I learned the lesson well and I think for, for people who may be listening to this sometime in the future who are wanting to do research work or development work with counterparts in operations, yes, it's a real challenge but you, you, and you have to kind of lean over backward to be successful but it's worthwhile when you do. But there was a very, it had a big impact on me because it wasn't fun to be humiliated. 
And also, I didn't want to get humiliated again. <laughs> so you, you learn from it, and it, it helped a lot in terms of learning how to, to work with the people and serve me well within the INCO organization and the Valley organization. And throughout your career, and we'll get more into INCO and, and Valley, but um, was there at any point a, a dysfunctional job or project even? That oh, you, you yeah. I had a couple of years in the early 2000s working, let's see, I was called the director of product research, and we were working uh, working in direct conjunction with INCO special products which was a uh, part of INCO that was a little subdivision of INCO that was made to uh, market products that it could make from nickel carbonyl or technology that INCO had. And also to develop other technologies. And the objective was to generate value added products from nickel that could be sold at a considerable premium to the uh, LME price. And that was a very dysfunctional organization. I don't think the business metrics were aligned correctly. The personnel didn't really mesh together. There was a lot of friction between the organizations. Uh, I think there was a fundamental flaw in the underlying business expectations, which probably contributed to the dysfunction, but it was a, a stressful time. And dysfunctional organizations are not fun to work in. No, how when long did that? That, that lasted for me for about about three to four years. And how, how did the change occur? Did you leave that? How did you leave that? I went, after? Well, after a while, I told people, I was in the technology development people, I said, I really, I just can't do this any longer. We need to find somebody else. And a, and a position opened up. So uh, I moved across into the more of the processing world of the mainstream of INCO business processing of metals. And um, this may be a difficult question, but what, what um, looking back, what's either the most difficult or the most challenging um, job or tasks you've ever, you've ever had professionally? Difficult or most challenging tasks? An example uh, that I hear once in a while when I ask this question is, uh, sometimes when people uh, eventually have higher up positions or positions where they have to manage people, the difficult thing is laying people off. Okay, well. But, um, <laughs> but it could be absolutely completely different. Um, okay, in my career, I counted it up one day. Not a great thing to count up. But I counted it up one day, and in my career, and I never. I was always in, working in technology groups, but over the period of my career, I probably laid off about 105 people. Uh, possibly the worst layoffs were in that I have had was in the 1997 period, about there, when we had to. I guess totally we had a group of about a hundred people. This was in Sudbury when I was heading the process technology group. And we had to discharge about 30 people. And we had gone through our list of, because the way people normally do this is you make a little list of your performers that you can do without. And you work your way down the priority list and then you get to think, okay, you feel comfortable with. And I was sitting in a group of about mm, six or seven people who reported to me directly, and we were about five people short. And I just basically looked at them and said, we have five more to go. Who are they? 
And that really wasn't very pleasant because all of a sudden people had to, and including me, had to had to had to look into the reality of uh, this is who you know we're we're cutting into the bone there, but this is how we're going to cut, and that was not a nice that was not a nice. Uh, scenario to to sit there and tell people but it happens every day and the other one I think was a put stressful was possibly the last assignment I had at Valley which was 2012 I got the job of leading about a six or nine I guess it turned out to be about a nine month study into how we would rationalize the Ontario operations away from making copper plus nickel to making just nickel and going to and considerably downsizing the operation and the reason this was a very actually a very interesting task we had people coming from all over the comp from all over the operating division in Sudbury and the technology center in Mississauga uh, and we did some really great work we came up with a great plan and the like but basically my job then was to design out all the stuff that I had invented and put into place 20, 25 years earlier, I guess, or something like that. So we, so I and a group in Sudbury created a, a, a novel process for producing copper from inco materials, which we invented during the 80s, commercialized during the early 90s, and then I think it was actually good work and quite successful. But then we had to, for all kinds of very reasonable economic reasons, had to figure out, so we just won't make copper anymore. So how are we going to do that? And it's a little bit tough to undesign something that you actually designed yourself in the first yeah, place. Like your, your baby. Yes, right, yes. So yes, now the, so the baby is grown up, it's operated for 20 years, but it's no longer any financial reason for it to operate, so how do we shut it down? And then to figure out how to do that, that's a little bit, was, was really challenging, intellectually challenging organ, organization-wise, because you're getting people to work from across the different disciplines and different ones, but you're also undoing what you took great pride mm -hmm. in doing. Absolutely. And that, that happens too. Yeah. Um, would you agree that metallurgy and a lot of those companies are very similar, or even tied to many of the mining companies that have cyclical business? So you were talking about uh, lays off, uh, layoffs, and, and, and it is kind of a recurring theme in, in um, my interviews. Uh, is it cyclical? Like mining? I, I uh, actually made a, for a year ago, I made a, a little um, PowerPoint chart in which I mapped onto the same space the nickel price and when I sent people home for layoffs. And uh, they mapped perfectly, on, they mapped perfectly well on top of each other with one exception, and that was a time when a, a executive vice president decided that we, the technology group, was too large so that we should send people home. It wasn't done at a time of low nickel prices. It was done that, yeah, we should just rationalize. But other than that, the one-to-one -one correspondence between the prices of nickel dropping and sending people home. And in INCO, we were probably more fortunate than in some of the other Canadian companies because during the 1980s and into the 90s, but especially in the 80s uh, and the 90s, the company was very concerned about two issues. Uh, one that I spent a lot of time on was looking at um, sulfur abatement from Sudbury. That was a major 
project in itself and took a lot of research and development effort at the, the laboratory pilot plant and commercial scales. So that, that cushioned us from a lot of the upsets connected with the economy. It didn't, it didn't mean it didn't happen. It just meant it wasn't as bad as it was in many places. And then in the 1990s, INCO was very interested in growing more and new nickel projects and going into New Caledonia, mm -hmm. uh, expanding in Indonesia. And once again, that's a multi-year type project. So the work continued as opposed to people who weren't involved in that who were more willing to say, well, we don't need to do the technology. So we were, I think, relatively speaking, we were cushioned, but it still was happened. And it is a cyclical part of the business, and uh, that, that, that's the reality. Mm. Um, could you explain the um, transformative history of INCO, and then into CVRD INCO, and to Valet? Uh, oh. All right, so could you explain the transformative history of INCO, uh, from INCO to CVR, INCO to Valet, and um, maybe also comment on how this, um, this has become a, a trend with many uh, Canadian natural resource companies? Okay, this is a multi-part question. For sure. Uh, why don't we why don't we go through the uh, the second part of the question in the, in the first place? Yeah, it's not just a trend in Canadian companies; it's a trend in companies worldwide. Um, we can I made a we can think in the North American companies who have which have disappeared since my career began. Um, American Smelting and Refining Company was a vintage company from, vintage company, American company from the early 20th century. Uh, basically went semi-bankrupt, if not bankrupt, was bought by Grupo Mexico. I think it's still called a SARCO, or parts of it are called a SARCO, but it basically does not exist. American Metal Climax, big American company involved in mining, uh, is somewhere, I, I can't remember what organization it is, but it doesn't really exist. Uh, Kennecott Copper, uh, there's one vestige of Kennecott Copper in uh, Salt Lake City, it's called Rio Tinto Kennecott, uh, which is one, 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 one operation, one mine, and one big mine, one very rich, valuable mine, and and one smelter, but it's basically part of Rio Tinto. Uh, in Canada, I'm sure Cypress Mining was another U.S. company that was reasonable size when I was in uh, school. St. Joe Minerals was another one. Uh, and come to Canada, Noranda, Cominco, which is now part of Tech. Placid Dome, which is part of Barrick, um, Falcon Bridge, Kit Creek, which is, well, that, most of that operation, or one Kit Creek, are just parts of that still alive. Um, anyway, I'm sure if I thought some more, we could come up with some more names. So it's just not a Canadian trend. It is a global trend. The, the, the companies have been, have been merged into what, what, what people call super major companies, uh, BHP, Bellaton, Rio Tinto, uh, and, and, and Valley are three mega mining companies. So it is a, it is a North American, it, it is a global phenomenon. Uh, driven by uh, economies of scale, driven by um, the cost 
of doing large projects that if you're going to do large projects you have to have lots and lots of money uh, it, large companies are the ones that tend to have lots and lots of money and interestingly enough in my opinion driven by many of the environmental regulations and uh, requirements that companies do lots of pre-engineering before they do projects. So if you're going to do a project today of any reasonable size, if it's a big project, you will be spending five to ten years from the time you make the decision to do the project to the time the project actually gets done during all this time you're doing pre-engineering, you're doing engineering, you're spending money, you're spending lots of money, you may not get approvals. It takes a lot of it takes a lot of money and only companies with deep pockets can afford to do these types of projects. Uh, everything has gotten bigger so the smaller companies have by necessity had been 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 merged, conglomerated into larger companies. So it's not necessarily a it's just not a Canadian phenomenon. It certainly has has has, has hit Canada pretty hard. Uh, um, my graduate professor, my graduate school professor, when I saw him a few years ago, he said, "Who could imagine?" that an INCO wouldn't exist. It's just unimaginable to him that INCO wouldn't exist. I would think that people would have said the same thing about Naranda, people would have said the same thing about uh, Kennecott, but it's just what's happened. The, um, the Valley takeover actually probably had its origins when INCO wanted, was wanting to merge with Falcon Bridge and then with uh, Phelps Dodge to, uh, for the sake of getting bigger and then it became apparent that the company was in play and could be, and could be purchased. The Valley, which was really formed at the end of the Second World War as CVRD, uh, had made a boatload of money from the iron ore business. Uh, the iron ore business was peaking because of the tremendous demand for steel in China and the ever increasing prices of iron ore. So when, when INCO became available and vulnerable, it basically made a cash offer for or Inco shares. Um, the merger with Falcon Bridge and and Inco got into um, trouble in the European Union concerning uh, possibilities of um, monopolies. Uh, I'm sure there was some validity to this, but it also was a possibility that there were people also protecting their own self-interests in, in keeping this from happening. I believe the biggest concern was around the refineries, because then between INCO and Falcon Bridge, virtually all the nickel that would be suitable for making super alloys would be coming from the combined company. INCO, the, 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 the group had agreed to divest itself of the Christensen refinery, which was the big value for in the Falcon Bridge agenda. That still wasn't adequate so it, for the people, so that merger was falling apart. And then INCO, Falcon Bridge sought out to see if they could merge with Phelps Dodge to make a North American mega company. Uh, I think that would have been a good combination, but the shareholders at Phelps Dodge said no to the CEO because they wanted to get their cash money out of it, uh, concerned that this would not generate cash, this would just, for, you know, cash for the shareholders, this would generate just ongoing business because someone had to pay for it, so they wouldn't go for the deal. 
And then, of course, uh, Valley, Inco got purchased by Valley, Falcon Bridge got purchased by Extrada, which didn't exist when I was a student. And, uh, and Phelps Dodge got overtaken by Freeport. So that was, that's kind of the summary of the business aspects from a, from a technocrat working in a company at the time who didn't have too much involvement in it except to make a one night trip to uh, Brussels to attend a meeting with uh, uh, Eurocrats and, and talk about a little bit of things, but anyway, interesting times. And uh, so Valley purchased Inco and uh, it sort of was a, it obviously was a fait accompli and the uh, CEO of Valley came up to inspect what he purchased. And this was an interesting day. I want to make certain I get this story right. He, his name was, oh, let's see, Jose Agnelli. Valley's from Brazil, right? Valley's yeah. a Brazilian company, yes. And Jose Agnelli came up and he arranged a meeting with the, um, with the Toronto office. And I was in the Mississauga uh, Technology Center and we were listening in on the phone call. And the meeting for him to address the, uh, the people was about four o'clock in the afternoon. And he started talking and it got to be five o'clock in the afternoon. And the INCO lady who was moderating the conflict thing started talking about the fact that, you know, the concept that people should be, that really the, the end of the work day was five o'clock. And one could hear the body language over the phone as to how this went over. Because while most of the people working in, many of the people working in Toronto would be accustomed to coming in at 9 o'clock or 8.30 and, and working and spending their day at 5 o'clock, they would go home, they would either get on the long commuter train home or go home to pick up their kids at, you know, at the, at the, at the, they care or the babysitting and, and, and it was kind of an custom. And of course in Brazil the world was quite different for the people working there. Uh, people come in early but it's quite common for people to stay at their workplace till seven or eight o'clock. Um, many of the people who work at, at Valley and in uh, Rio or other places would have um, nannies to look after their children so there was no need to get home and part of the culture was to this is part of their culture so there was an immediate uh, uh, immediate idea of a shift in culture between the two organizations very fundamental in in the world we live in uh, because different uh, Canada is a more egalitarian country than, than Brazil at, at this point in time, so this, uh, so that you don't have the, 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 the ser a, a quote, servant class helping the people who are working in the industry, so people do more of their own things. And uh, so th th that probably summed up some of the cultural clashes that occurred in the two organizations in a pretty much nutshell a whole different view of life in uh, in in how people work together uh, the the in in Canada we are reasonably it's not always a case because when I worked in the Coppercliff smelter we were talking about people smelter time because meetings in the Coppercliff smelter never started on time or very seldom started on time in the early 80s but generally meetings 
generally started on time. But in Brazilian culture, they would tell you that in general, the most important person for the meeting comes in last. And uh, so that the meeting really doesn't get started to the most important person there. And I would say that probably continued for a while inside Valley Canada, that culture was. And it, it, that pretty well shifted, though. People came to understand that the expectation is if a meeting starts at 10 o'clock, it starts at 10 o'clock and everybody comes. But in the early days, there was this cultural divide between how a meeting is organized and who does what and, and when they show up and, and, and like that. And that created a fair bit of friction along the way. Uh, the people who came, the people who came were in general, uh, well, well educated. Uh, there's a lot of national pride around Valley and the idea that uh, a company from a developing country could 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 you know acquire a, a company in a, in a in a developed country, and there was a lot of pride that came into that, and that was a little bit of a that that probably rubbed a lot of people in Canada the wrong way in, in terms of the, the pride that came along these lines, the nationalism of coming in the pride. Uh, my ex-boss, in an effort to show pride, uh, had the Brazilian flag put on the same flagpole as the Canadian flag. That stayed for a little while until someone looked up and found out that is the not the right protocol. You cannot. You're not supposed to have two flags on the same staff. So, mm -hmm. uh, let's see. There was another interesting cultural difference. Amazingly enough, oh, look. I think there was a from a technology development point of view. I found that while the most the people I saw were generally quite technically competent and well-educated, they were also somewhat what I would consider to be naive about what can be done and uh, what what cannot be done. Very, very, didn't have, I thought, probably not the depth of experience or depth of understanding that the people in Canada had simply because of the experience, because many of them were quite young. And, and, you know, hadn't had a lot of experience. It is a developing country, a very young country coming to Canada, which is actually quite an old country in many respects. And so there wasn't the same degree of, uh, let's call it savoir faire in terms of getting things done and understanding what could be done in terms of technology development. A different expectation around uh, labor relations, a totally different... Um, different view of, of course, there's a different view of labor unions in Brazil from what there is in, in Canada. And uh, a more expectation that labor would be more, more amenable to cooperation than it is in Canada. Of course, there was the big strike at Valley from, I think, 2009 to 2010, something in that, that lasted about 15 months, I believe, one of the longest strikes in Canadian history. And actually, I, this is not the, the most political thing to say to Tom, but in my opinion, probably INCO needed to take a strike at that point in its development. Uh, the nickel prices, of course, went into the sewer in the early 80s, came back in 1988. Sort of stayed reasonable for the early part of the 90s and got low in the later part of the 90s and then picked up again in the 2000s. Uh, I, I think the, I think INCO management was not 
probably did probably gave away too much of money during these periods to the point at which too much of the resource was going into the uh, into the labor pool, and that that would include staff as well as 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 as, as, as hourly worker. So it was probably needed to do something fairly radical to to get the balance to get the to get the system more in balance. And sometimes I think in this world that takes a strike. It was my perception that INCO would, would, would not take a long strike because of what it would do to its balance sheet as a standalone company. Maybe this gets back to why you need large, why, why large companies. But a large company like Valley could take the strike because it would have the money, it wouldn't, it wouldn't bother the balance sheet so much. Mm -hmm. So Valley was willing to take the strike. Um, probably, if yeah, I would have probably taken the strike in a different way. I don't think the company went into the strike with enough um, with enough inventory of very important products, products that basically Valley was the only producer of. It had about six months supply when the strike started. It needed around one year or fifteen months supply. Uh, didn't have it. I uh, don't think that culturally the, the necessary the, the right approach was taken to dealing with the unions. I think people misunderstood how important the labor movement is to Canadian society and especially the society around Sudbury, where there's a long history of of um, strong labor and, and movements and it becomes part of the culture and you, one has to be really careful when one starts dealing with people's cultural expectations and norms. So I don't think it was necessarily handled right, but I think the strike was probably, was probably needed. So that was a, but that was another example of some, I think some cultural differences coming to the fore in in the uh, in the world, and I guess two other points I make. One of them was from a very personal view. I, I, I did my personal profession probably did better under the the Valley organization than it did under the Inco organization. How so? Well, I got a promotion. I did well in that job. We were quite, we were quite, um, quite productive in this period. Valley was more interested in spending money on technology development than the, than the income management had been. So we were able to find more money to do very interesting work and very valuable work. So that was, that was what I mean. And I think the other interesting thing, and this is somewhat trivial but very important. Uh, okay, okay, well, 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 yeah, there's one of one. Valley was actually much more interested in having women in important roles in the workplace than the INCO management was. In fact, it was very, very clear that they appointed women to senior positions with the purpose of we're going to have a, a competent and diverse workforce. And that was much more so, much more, much more apparent than it was with the Canadian management in place. So, yeah. uh, but finally, one of the cultural differences that people don't think about is the weather. <laughs> as far as I could tell, every person who came here from Brazil for much of the winter was cold all the time, or for much of the time. And if you were used to, well, I don't know, when I used to go to Brazil in July or June, the height of the, the height of the Canadian summer and the depths of the Brazilian winter, the temperatures were roughly the same. So when you, that's what you've been living in, and then you come to Canada, yep. 
and all you see is snow, ice, and cold for months on end, you, uh, it, it, I think it changes your outlook on life. It makes you wonder, uh, you know, it, it has to cloud your, 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 your thinking. I took a fellow to um, Newfoundland who was a good, really good guy. I liked him a lot. And we went to Newfoundland in March, I guess. But there was a vicious wind coming off the North Atlantic. And he, he emptied his suitcase putting on his clothes. He looked, when he finished, he looked like a bag lady. Because he was cold. So that, that, had a, that had an impact on how people viewed, you know, how, how they felt about their lives, I think. And that, that, that impacts things. So, so I, one, one, I think he was a member of provincial parliament out of Manitoba, or maybe he was a member of parliament from Manitoba, once asked me if, Brazilians and Canadians have the same values. And he was asking it for a reason. I think that's a very interesting question. And my view, my answer was yes. Uh, Canada and the and the U.S. and and Brazil are basically have large Judeo-Christian heritages. Um, similar aims for their children. Uh, in some respects, Canada, I mean, Brazil is more socially conservative than Canada is. Uh, every, you know, the same ideas about marriage, all, all, all the topics are quite similar. So the values, the underlying values are, 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 are European, are, are the same. I mean, that's like Latin, but it's the same. The, um, but how they expressed and how they actualized are quite different in terms of how you work, how you view yourself. Uh, Brazilian society is more stratified than Canadian society, but the people there were very proud when they talked about the number of people who had reached the middle class, internationally defined definitions of middle class as a result of the economic boom in Brazil during the 2000s, and took great pride that large numbers of people were making their way into the middle class. Uh, so. The values were the same, but how they expressed were different. Uh, how they worked were different. So that that created a bit of t tension. Yeah, but lots of lots of good things as yeah. well. Yeah. Yes. And mm -hmm. could you elaborate a little bit on um, not only with Valley, but throughout your entire career um, about uh, the presence. Or absence of women in the workplace. <laughs> uh, the answer to it is in the technology world, in the mining and met and process metallurgy world, there are actually not all that many women. And these days, people are very concerned about why that is. And I think there are many reasons. Um, when I started working in the 1970s and 1980s in the workplace, you would find lots of pinup girls, naked women, pictures on the wall. I used to have a very rude drawing on my uh, wall, and the women who would join the workforce at that time would clearly have to put up with that. Um, when I went to Sudbury in 1988, 
the manager of the smelter there, a man named Jose Blanco, very, very good guy, had pushed all that out of the smelter so that all the calendars were gone. He was probably one of the exceptions to have done that by 1988. I don't think we really got civilized till the 1990s. Uh, but certainly not in the, maybe the late 80s was when the civilization started. At the same, interestingly enough, um, about 2005, one of the employees, a male who was working in a plant at, in Wales at the time, called me up and he was complaining about the naked women in the calendars in the workplace in Wales in 2005. So I don't know where Canada goes in the uh, in the scheme of things, but it's certainly in 2005 they were still by up. And I think I'm sure they have gone by now, but it took a while to to do that. Uh, one of the things that I did in my last few years at in the Inco Technology in the Valley Technology Center was um, I appointed a woman to run the administrative part of the laboratory. She was almost my age, and she'd been the librarian for thirty years. But I thought she could do this job and she did a very credible job. She did it for three years and she told me that I had extended her working life by two years because if she'd stayed in the library she was going to quit. But I guess what I'm trying, and the other thing I did, and I think this is interesting too, in, in, that, in that time frame, I started a program in the laboratory in which we did a lot of renovations and one of them was increasing the number of ladies washrooms mm -hmm. because when the building was built in the 1960s there weren't too many women in a, in a even in a mining research laboratory uh, workspace so it had very few facilities for women there was no uh, I don't, there wasn't a real locker room for women and it had not been changed in 40 years. So we put in more ladies' washrooms. In Sudbury, there was a woman engineer who in the technical services building had to insisted on that she needed a shower because when you came in the workforce, it wasn't that. And her boss, talk the smelter manager into putting in a shower and this was probably in 1982 or 83 at a cost of $35,000 which would have been a ridiculous cost in, in that time frame for a shower but that was a type of facilities that were available for women and so the number of women that I actually worked with in the workplace, you could probably count on both hands. And to obviously there were underlying exclusions, uh, you know, cat calls and the like, uh, the naked pictures and the like. But also, I believe that women have self-selected out of the mining world. I don't think it is just, it's not just because of all these, all these underlying social factors and like that. It's because somehow in the mining world, we haven't succeeded in, in, uh, in it, it, women have not found it very appealing and I'm not going to talk about the reasons for women haven't been very appealing I don't think it's a lot it's certainly not a lack of ability or lack of um, you know getting things done when when they make up their minds to there's something in in this in this endeavor that has not proven to be congruent with what 
what, 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 the Venn diagrams are not intersecting very well, in my opinion. Um, I read an article recently that uh, women are, you know, very big into uh, engineering that is connected with sustainability, uh, any sort of engineering that is connected to biological fields. I believe in the educational system there are more women than men. And the mining, it is about, I don't know, something like 20% 20, 20 perhaps, or maybe even less, I think it's less now, maybe 17% women in the in the schools in mining. And it's a real shame because we're not taking advantage of that part of the world's expertise. Uh, I, at this point in time, I do not believe it's because of overt exclusion on the part of men. I think it's more that there's not appeal there, so, so that women mm -hmm. self-select out of the endeavor. And it makes it difficult then to have a representative workforce. I would have liked to have more women to 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 work in areas of of authority, but not not allowed. Well, thanks for that answer. Um, we would briefly mention their interest. Maybe it was more like in uh, sustainable mining things like that. Um, you were actually awarded the Environmental Improvement Award. Um, so could you elaborate on that? What, what kind of work have you done um, for improving the environment? Or The uh, Environmental Improvement Award came from the work that I did as part of the sulfur dioxide abatement project in Sudbury in 1988 to 1993. We talked about it a little bit before when I mentioned about the new copper process we developed. And uh, the copper process in Sudbury was extremely important because the ores that come out of the ground in Sudbury have about equal weights of copper plus nickel. Uh, one is unable to completely separate the copper from the nickel and the nickel from the copper. Uh, and when we started the project for this SO2 abatement project, there was no real way to treat, uh, there was no good way to treat the nickel containing, the, cop, the copper, the calcocyte, the copper sulfide containing nickel, small amounts of nickel. So we had to develop a new way of, develop, of, 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 of processing this copper. And we did this work starting in the laboratory scale in Mississauga. Uh, in very one pound tests went through the the um, pilot plant tests at Port Colburn and then tested it commercially in Sudbury and we made it work and it had a tremendous impact on the operation it it saved a bunch of money relative to the options and before we put in the process in Sudbury, they had maybe a hundred uh, ground level exceedances of SO2 that would be exceed higher concentrations of sulfur dioxide at the ground level and that they're permitted to have a year, about a hundred a year, so on average every third day, except it only really occurred in the summertime. And when we completed this, and that was predominantly from the processing of copper, and when we put in the new project, we processed this number dropped from 100 a year down to about 10 per year, and eventually went to zero per year. So that was a, that was a major that was a major improvement in. Um, in the environmental performance from that part of the smelter to get rid of those ground levels and it was a fantastic experience to take something from the crucible up to scale up to the uh, up to the final scale. Um, that sulfur abatement project 
what, the largest sulfur abatement project in the world at that time, perhaps even still today, was a, was a, was a very interesting time in a career for a fellow in his late 30s, early 40s to work on and develop a new process, troubleshoot the new equipment and the like, and very, very interesting work. Interesting partly because we were doing work at the commercial scale and then actually cooperating with a professor at McMaster University to do tests at the laboratory scale and moving things back and forth from the laboratory to the plant. So it was a good time. Um, looking back, well, I'll just have a few closing questions. Looking back, um, you can split this in two. Um, when asked this, it can be a tough question because it can be a very large question, but what are you proudest of in life? And we can ask, what are you proudest of in life? And, and what are you proudest of in life professionally? Well, we can talk about the profession. The proudest of in life in general is a tough question. What right. are you going to be proud of? Um, uh, professionally, I am proud of the work I did on the sulfur abatement project because that was a little technical challenge. But the other thing that I'm, I'm proud of, and this is interesting because people don't, I don't think people fully understand sometimes how things come into reality. In in about 1996, 97, I initiated a project in Sudbury. Initiated meaning got approval for a project, a capital project in Sudbury that would increase, that increased the recovery of nickel by about four percentage points. And four percentage points of nickel in Sudbury at the time was about eight million pounds of nickel. Nickel was selling for about uh, $3 a pound then. Oh. So that had been $24 million. And that's equivalent for a small mine. It would be equivalent for a small mine. And we did that for capital of expenditure of a few million dollars. Maybe, no, maybe it's maybe five million or something like that. But it wasn't really much. And what's interesting about that was this was not only technical. People who worked for me had developed a technical. But it was also political. And I'm proud of that because we had developed the technology. We would, could not have just taken the technology to people on any particular day and said, we're going to do it today. We had to wait the right time for the politics, for the time to be ripe to make the suggestion. And we did that. I, I, I largely did that. And so, so you're so proud because we had a, a, a technical aspect. We had a political aspect. We managed to bring the two together. We did something that created the equivalent of a small mine for very little cost. And we also have to remember that we were actually throwing away a resource mm -hmm. that was being thrown away partly for reasons people didn't know how to do anything better like this. But we, but we, we saved the resource, a real resource that, that and, and that's something to be, you know, there's shortages of resources in the world. And when you can manage to do something like that for very little cost, even if it's not a Nobel Prize winning work or anything like that, and if it's, that was probably 70% technical and what 30% political, but the 30% political was the true, was the true enabler. So that's, that's, I think that's something that I'm proud of. Good. And uh, we'll finish with um, one of my favorite questions. 
if you were to speak to someone uh, much younger, like, uh, like you, myself, yeah, like you, yeah, yeah, a yeah, yeah, student, yeah. Uh, w what's the most um, looking back at your career and, and and your life? What's the most important life lesson you could give them, or piece of advice? Well, I presume you're talking about somebody thinking about their career. Sure. Sure. Well, actually, it's interesting. Right before we came in here, I was having a discussion with a young fellow I met who just finished his PhD here at U of T in geophysics, and I was asking him what he was doing. He'd been working. And he said he was working here in Toronto. Uh, so what type, what are you doing with geophysics here in Toronto? I was like, measuring what the subways do when they go by. So no, he's working for a, um, a company out of Calgary. So, you know, all the action for geophysics is not in Toronto. The action is where oil is. So, and I said, you should get, you know, I gave him a real gear about, you know, you should ask him why are you staying here? Well, his fiance is a dentist. She has a practice. He likes the city, blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know, you got to, you got to do geophysics where geophysics is being done, not in a branch plant. You're not going to go anywhere in a branch plant. Uh, I joined INCO because INCO at the time had the best power metallurgy in the country. I took a pay cut to come to Canada. I mean a pay cut in real dollars, not, not in pure dollars. I was make, not, not in equivalent dollars because I wanted to do this, because it's what I wanted to do. So I think that people, uh, uh, yeah, don't work in a branch plant, uh, do what interests you and go to where the action is. And the other thing I tell young people is be sure that your, your, um, your moral compass is aligned with the requirements of your job. The example we talked about earlier, I've laid off 105 people. Uh, that's not a lot for a lot of people who shut down major corporations, but 105 people is not a trivial number either. Did I enjoy doing it? Of course not. Um, did I always approve of when we did it? No. We didn't always do it at the right time or right place. But, but other than being difficult and missing a few nights sleep, it didn't continue to gnaw at me that I had had to do this. But I can easily see where people, were, there's clearly nothing illegal about that. We always follow the law. In fact, INCO and Valley have both followed pretty, followed Canadian regulations along those lines. But there are many people who would say that I just won't do that. And I don't think that young people starting a career should choose, they should choose jobs that, that they can do the components of the job and not bother their, their sense of right mm. or sense of morals. I think that's, if you do that, you're just asking for trouble. Well, thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it.